The dead know only one thing, it is better to be alive. In 1987, Stanley Kubrick released a Vietnam War movie which resonated with audiences worldwide. In today's episode of Nightmare Fuel, I am going to discuss the psychological and physical battles fought in Full Metal Jacket. There will be spoilers ahead, and please check the links to our upcoming project, The Horror Exchange, below. Often considered to be amongst Kubrick's best, this adaptation of Gustav Hasford's semi-autobiographical novel The Short Timers, based on his own experiences in Vietnam, Full Metal Jacket is a film of two distinct sections, one which takes place in boot camp, the other in the conflict itself. Both segments provide some tenacious moments which cling to your memory bank long after Paint It Black plays in the credits. I will begin discussing the boot camp segment, which I think is the more impactful segment of the two. The film opens with possibly the most quotable character in Kubrick's catalogue. R. Lee Ermey is at a career best as Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, the venom-spewing drill instructor who has his platoon by the balls. There's zero remorse here, keeping in line with the stern military mindset. However, you do just wonder how warranted Hartman's actions are here. Sure, he needs to condition the Marines to extremely tough circumstances to harden their resilience, but bloody hell, the constant pressure Hartman puts them under is on another level. It's like being micromanaged, your every move and every word you speak under surveillance 24-7, and anything out of place that Hartman doesn't like can result in consequences, even if you're not at fault. This is all explored through the catalyst of Full Metal Jacket's first act, Leonard Lawrence, played tremendously by Vincent D'Onofrio. He, along with several other soldiers, are provided with somewhat derogatory nicknames by Hartman, which end up sticking because it's on Hartman's direct orders that these are their names from now on. For example, we have Private Joker, played by Matthew Modane, named because he mocks Hartman with a John Wayne impression. He's our main character for the second act of the film. We also get Private Cowboy, named as he's from Texas, and Private Snowball, an ironic dig at his skin tone not being white. The opposite of this is seen in the second act with a black soldier named Eight Ball. These are little personal bits of sarcasm, or an insult which the soldiers have to carry around with them from now on, a permanent term of address which mocks them every time it's said. In the case of Leonard, he's labelled as Private Pyle, named after Goma Pyle, a character from The Andy Griffith Show, whose traits include being a naive simpleton. Therefore, every time Private Pyle is addressed as such, it's a constant jab at his lack of intelligence or maturity. He's like a big child who's been drafted into a place where men are expected, and Hartman takes advantage of this with problematic results. Pyle notably struggles during the training process not possessing a high enough level of fitness and not having a full comprehension of things. He's undisciplined because he's extremely difficult to teach, but this doesn't prevent Hartman from pushing. Even in their first encounter, Pyle can't keep a straight face and Hartman ends up choking him for his lack of seriousness. You can clearly see that Pyle isn't a man who belongs in the Marine Corps. He's simply not physically or mentally capable for it, yet it's Hartman who constantly pushes him, belittling him and wearing him down. He could have some level of forgiveness or morality, understand that Pyle isn't fit for duty and discharge him, but then that could be twisted to look like Hartman can't do his job properly. Pyle's failure could reflect badly on Hartman and the rest of the platoon, but Pyle's training goes from fiercely pushing him for conditioning to something far worse. After failing to correctly prepare his footlocker, Hartman discovers a jelly donut which Pyle has taken from the mess hall and hidden away. Pyle has already been insulted for his weight, and this is just a nail in the coffin for that argument. But rather than punishing Pyle directly, Hartman dishes out the punishment to other troops. It is not Pyle who has failed by taking the donut, instead it's deemed that the platoon are at fault for not being able to improve Pyle. And so, not only in this instance, but all future instances where Pyle fails at something, he's put to one side, made to look like an idiot, while the rest of the men 
then face the consequences in the form of having to do more exercise drills. This makes the soldiers volatile, becoming infuriated at having to endure additional pain on behalf of Pyle's incompetence. In a vicious scene, the platoon decide they want to execute some payback on Pyle, and so they restrain him and one by one batter him with bars of soap. An entire platoon of men smashes Pyle's body with these hard blocks, putting him through severe pain so that he finally receives his punishment for his stupidity. It's a cruel form of hazing known as a blanket party, sometimes known as lock socking, and is something employed in real life. This is one of the film's most brutal scenes for me based on the context. Hartman pushes Pyle further and further in such an unfair manner, taking advantage of him for not being up to standard. Yet because everybody is entangled in Hartman's militaristic shroud, nobody can talk normally about it. Everyone has to bark out their conversations because that is the way. Yet due to this, it's not possible to properly discuss Pyle in a human-like manner. It's all very animalistic and primal, and the one person this impacts the most is Pyle himself. Though he does show signs of maturity, improving his character, demonstrating his capabilities and understanding, everything winds up as the film's biggest shock. During the night, Joker finds Pyle in the restroom area grasping his rifle, loading it with live rounds. Just look at his expression. Pyle is twisted. He's become deranged from what he's experienced in the training camp. His mind has gone and all that's left is broken. A dangerous man. It's like we see the result of how hard the military can push you. A placid, docile man was put into this regime, and that the other end of it has become damaged by it. A jagged shadow of his former self. He is, as he describes, in a world of shit, reaffirming the barbaric nature of his experiences. When Hartman enters the fray, Pyle fully displays how unhinged he has become by shooting down Hartman before turning the rifle on himself, taking his own life. From a young man with a clouded mind to his mind being splattered all over the tiles. This is a tense and groundbreaking moment in the film, which fully displays what the pressure cooker environment of warfare can do to a man's mind. And the scariest part is that this is just the training process. It can absolutely be argued that Hartman went too far with Pyle, and that his own death is at his own fault for not recognising or correcting the severity of Pyle struggles. However, with Pyle and Hartman now dead, it was time for Joker to enter the field of combat. This brings us into the second portion of Full Metal Jacket, and though not as strong as the first in my opinion, it still contains some startling moments which leave an impression. Gustav Hasford, the author of The Short Timers, spent his time in Vietnam as a war correspondent, and this is the role he provides for Joker. He works for Stars and Stripes, a real daily newspaper which provides updates on the US military. Even in times of warfare, there's still a media influence which wants to take a piece, and in order to obtain accuracy, people are put into the field of combat to write about their experiences. Joker is not only a soldier, he's a journalist too. Though Stars and Stripes has existed since the American Civil War, it's still quite a baffling concept to me, how people can be fighting and losing their lives all around, yet some people are in that whirlwind of bullets and flames simply to get the scoop. It's truly eye-opening how the battlefield can have more extracted from it based on what remains. Speaking of remains, we get a chilling scene where there's several bullets bodies in a mass grave which have been covered in lime. Though the decomposition effects haven't yet kicked in, by covering the corpses with lime, the smell of decomposition can be absorbed. In effect, they don't want these bodies to be found, and are masking the scent of decay. This is a horrible notion which was also employed by the Nazis during the Second World War. Seeing it here and realising its purpose provided a haunting scene to say the least. Another haunting scene comes when a dead Vietnamese soldier is unveiled, being kept like a toy by the US troops. He is said to be the guest of honour to a birthday party. 
his birthday party. Yet it's just so chilling that this man's corpse is being used as a plaything for a joke. It really devalues human life if it can be taken with such a level of passiveness. Though it is said that playing with dead bodies in such a way is a sign of PTSD and advanced fatigue. For these soldiers to be doing this with the body in the first place is a sign that they're psychologically and physically damaged by the conflict. They thrive in this conflict, saying that these are great days that they're living, and that they are jolly green giants walking the earth with guns. We eventually wind up in Full Metal Jacket's big action set piece, which is masterfully directed. We see our squad now led by Cowboy from Boot Camp, after the previous squad leader was killed by a booby trap. The squad has gathered word that the area ahead is now free of the NVA, and they have to scout ahead to verify that report. However, due to some navigational errors, the squad winds up lost and they are ambushed by an enemy sniper. This provides for a remarkably tense viewing experience, as the sniper cannot be seen. It's an invisible threat, one which picks off three of the squad members during their advance, including Cowboy. You never know what move the sniper is going to make next, and when the men make their moves, your heart winds up in your mouth because you don't know if that next shot is coming or not. In a vicious climax to the film, Joker is able to locate the sniper, and finds it to be a young girl. She is shot down and lies on the ground, praying, eventually begging to be shot. What we see here is a teenager, a child soldier, caught up in the madness of it all, deadly enough to kill, but still so young, tarnished by the war's requirements. Her life is on the verge of a premature ending, which is a cruel fate war is capable of. Just standing around this young dying girl is enough to shake up the men, and after they agree to mercy kill the sniper, Joker is made the one to do it. You can see the dread on his face, not wanting to carry out the act. Despite his hesitation, he does it anyway. The peace symbol he wears which conflicted his thoughts is pushed aside, as it's the message on his helmet that comes to life here. Joker was born to kill. And as the troops march off into the firelit night, singing the Mickey Mouse march, Joker echoes the words of Pyle, that he is in a world of shit. However, he's alive, and he's not afraid. It's as though killing the girl has activated a sense of power in Joker, and that he's now capable of flourishing in this environment. He, like Pyle, lacked a sense of maturity, though in Joker's case it centred around his wisecracking persona. But when jokes are put aside, both wound up pulling the triggers they never should have had to have pulled. One escaped the hell, one found a home there. Full Metal Jacket is a fantastic cinematic achievement, and one one which highlights the psychological scars of warfare in enemy territory and on home turf. And because of its bleak messages, it's earned its place on our Nightmare Fuel Hall of Fame. I'm Connor from Unleash the Ghouls, thank you for watching this episode, and I'll see you again with another dose of Nightmare Fuel. Yeah.